top is on the strategic team committee of the whole and its update on our foundational excellence enterprise risk management and procurement modernization and as you can tell by the title there's three sections there's about a 10 minute presentation for each section and then we'll have plenty of time for conversations i've asked the team that we'll do each section at a time then we can ask questions and then we can move to the next because even though they're all connected you might have individual questions um, and so uh, finance is here that will lead the strategic team committee of the whole. The presentation is an update on the work across uh, the county that is already occurring um, and focused on the strategic priority of building wealth in our community. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Alex Kutza. I still don't do it. It only took me this long. Thank you, Alex, um, uh, to, to take away and get us started. Alex. Great, thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Good morning. Um, we're very happy to be here today uh, and um, present the work that not only is the strategic team work, but the entire county work. This supports all of the different areas that you saw, not only in the amazing video this morning, but also through the presentations, that this foundational work supports the work that all of my colleagues and all of um, our 4,000 employees, as well as the residents who interact with Ramsey County um, do every day. So with that, I'm hoping we can go to the presentation. Perfect. Okay, so I'm joined today by my colleagues up at the table. First, we're gonna talk about foundational excellence um, and Deanna Pesek, the Chief Compliance and Ethics Officer here, is here for part of that, as well as Tara Bach, who is the Director of Operational and Support Services within Finance. Then we'll go to Enterprise Risk Management and our Enterprise Risk Manager, Jenny Grosskopf, will be presenting that section. And then we'll finish, um, as you all have gotten a few updates on procurement modernization, I never want to uh, let a chance go by to update you more on procurement modernization and continue the momentum that we have. So our goals for the workshop, um, I know these, these appear as three separate areas, but really, as I mentioned, they are foundational to the work that we do. Um, we are providing information and updates today. We want to have a discussion with all of you on our progress. We're previewing an ask for a disparity study, something that is really important to me and I know many of you and how we're going to get there as part of this. And then we'll talk about what's next. Um, all of this work is connected through, uh, as I mentioned, the high standards that we hold ourselves to throughout the county and this work supports all of that. So going into foundational excellence, um, the first section of the presentation, just a reminder, in the 22-23 budget, you allocated $1.2 million for 2022 and $1.4 million for 2023 for foundational excellence. The goal of this was really to ensure that the policy work across the county was done with proper oversight. So when you think about serving clients and serving the people the residents of Ramsey County. To do that, we have to have things in place to support that work so that resident-facing employees have, they don't have to worry about those kind of things. They don't have to worry about how we contract for things. They don't have to worry about managing risk or audits or things. Those are things that are foundationally built across the entire county and support all of their work across HR, the strategic team, um, um, compliance, and policy. So we have been working towards the goals we laid out in the budget. And although implementation has been slower than we had hoped, we have done many things that you're gonna hear about today, um, including filling positions and moving forward on much of this work. So I just wanna make sure, I know I've reiterated this, but um, this is really important investment and I really appreciate you. That doesn't always get the excitement of some of the other more resident facing work and the fact that you were supporting this throughout the budget process i cannot thank you enough for that because it is really important to the work we do every day that we have proper oversight and i know our chief compliance and ethics officer will agree with that in her section i'm going to turn it over to her now um, to present thank you cfo kutza madam chair commissioners Please let me, allow me to introduce the Compliance and Ethics Office, our functions, and our staff. From, for this org chart, I'll start with compliance. Chris Bogut is our healthcare compliance manager who also oversees data practices. Chris is supported by Mary Lee, 
and Mary Lee is our medical records technician. She joined us in July of 2022 from the Ramsey County Care Center. Mm -hmm. Moving to operations, I'm pleased to announce that we have a new operations, uh, <clears throat> sorry, policy and operations manager who will be joining in 2023, January. Um, all the way to the right of the chart is investigations, and our investigations team is led by Chris, Christine Weber, our interim investigations manager. Christine is supported by our investigator, uh, Tanya Harris. Christine and Tanya both transferred over from human resources um, as a part of the consolidation that we'll discuss in the next slide, which leads us to the next slide, foundational excellence. Um, we'll start discuss our discussions with um, investigations. The investigations unit was moved to compliance in 2021 from community corrections and human resources. In order to build um, investigations capacity, you approved an additional position, and we mapped out a dynamic plan to transform and modernize uh, the function. This work was started even before the team transitioned over to compliance, and will continue through 2024. My top priorities have been ensuring that the team is adequately staffed and properly supported, and I'm happy to report that we have two new investigators joining in January 2023. We are currently recruiting to permanently fill the manager role, and we're at the final stages of implementing our first ever case management tool. Wow. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, that says a lot, yes. Um, and I, I want to thank Jolie Wood, who is a planning manager, but worked um, out of class as a compliance manager and helped and did a fantastic job helping to support these efforts. I also want to thank uh, Christine Weber, who stepped up and took responsibility for implementing the tool and also leading the work on behalf of the compliance office and the investigations team. Um, I, I'll continue to provide updates to you um, through the audit committee as we continue to mature the program. So you'll hear more. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the internal audit function has been another major focus of compliance. One of the first things that CFO Kutza and I bonded over was the need for <laughs> um, an internal audit for an organization of this size. Uh, to build the internal audit office, we, follow a, we followed a similar um, method of research and, um, and work around structural work that we did in, around the investigations unit. Um, we put in a considerable amount, considerable amount of professional um, standards reviews, um, market research, and we consulted with professional auditors. We also began plans to help improve and modernize the audit committee and aligned ourselves more so that we can align ourselves more closely with other organizations that are similarly structured. I'm proud of the work we've done and the connections we forged with other um, government agencies around uh, Minnesota. And, um, but the market's been really challenging. So we've, we've run recruitments to find uh, someone to lead this function but you know the market's been tight, and so in order to, um, and we just we didn't want to to we didn't want to jump into um, we didn't want to get swept away. So we were taking our time and ensuring that we find the right candidate for the role. So we decided to pivot and engage a consultant to support us in our continued development, and so that we can make motain, sorry maintain momentum. Uh, and lastly, on this slide, I'll jump to the community auditors. Um, this is an initiative uh, that came out of discussions with the Equity Action Circle uh, Policy and Practices Committee, Subcommittee. Sorry, the initiative, um, the initial concept was to find a way for community to evaluate our services. Um, we are still in the early stages of discussion, and we'll bring more back to you as we continue to develop this role as well. Excellent. And I'll stand for questions after at the end, but I'll pass it over to Tara Bach. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. 
Another area of investment um, with, within the foundational excellence is the operational support services. You may recall back in the early days of um, COVID and the county received the CARES funding, there was this recognition that uh, programs and our community partners were going, that we, there was a need for this additional support with contracting with so many additional vendors. And so back in uh, mid-2020, we put um, what was originally considered a temporary team together um, to help build these relationships with vendors and provide the supports that they needed, uh, helping them to understand their contracts and making sure their invoices were paid, uh, helping them to understand um, some of the reporting requirements that are required by federal funding. Um, and so we put a team together um, to help s support this work and it continued um, once when the county received the American Rescue Plan uh, funding as well. And so the success of this team along with um, the procurement modernization work um, drove our decision to invest in building um, our operational support services. So currently what we ended up getting, um, so procurement is a, is a partnership between finance and the county attorney's office. So three new positions were added to finance um, and one of them has been filled and was funded by uh, finance where the other two were funded through the foundational excellence request. There was an additional 1.2 FTEs added to the county attorney's office um, and they do play a critical role um, in contracting. So um, the others, so the county attorneys has been filled, one in finance has been filled. The others will be filled when we're a little further along in procurement modernization where we truly define where the need is because from procurement through contract administration and supporting vendors is sort of one big process. And so we're, we're going to be um, kind of finalizing where those new positions will be as we get further along in procurement modernization. Thank you. Um, the, the last area of investment in foundational excellence is around the building of payroll and inclusion capacity. So I think some of you know in July of 2022, we actually centralized our payroll under HR. We've got our, Dr. Porbeni is here um, and can answer questions in this area as well. So we had added an, one FT for this area that is filled. They consolidated and really what this is about is the partnership across all of um, the entire county, right? Because people like to get paid and they like to get paid accurately. So bringing those teams, I know it's funny, huh? <laughs> I know. Um, so bringing uh, that team together and making sure that they're consistent, that they have backup, that they can resolve errors together as a team and work across both with finance and HR and compliance to make sure that the work is done is, is we're still working towards that, but a lot of progress has been made. A lot of team building has been invested in, a lot of training, um, and that team is really working hard to move us forward. I would say that's a big success of foundational excellence and how that work has moved forward. In addition, there are two FTEs related to the Americans with Disabilities Act and equal opportunity. We're lucky to have a new CHRO that has a lot of expertise in this area, and she has been working with um, Chief Compliance Officer Pesek to make sure that they are aligned, and I know those are gonna be moving forward early in 2023. Um, and with that, the next slide, then I always like to put an ask when I come forward. Um, so all of, this, all of this work and what we're talking about here is foundational excellence. Back in 2017, many of you know, there was an opportunity to go forward with the state of Minnesota to do a disparity study. Uh, Ramsey County did not join that effort, and since that time, we have had a review of our work by Keen Consultants, where we set some aspirational goals, and we have been moving systematically forward in that area so that we can think about how do we do this better. We've been working with our PCAT teams, the Procurement and Contracting Action teams. We've been working with our CERT vendors, and we've been doing a lot of efforts to move us forward. There are things we cannot do without a disparity study. Just we cannot have a race and gender based program. We have to be neutral without that. Um, many of our peer jurisdictions have a disparity study and they are able to do things we are not able to do. So um, never letting an opportunity slip by. 
This really supports foundational excellence work, and because we had a slower start to some of this work, there's remaining funding. And it will be coming forward early in 2023 with an ask to move some of that funding in order to do a disparity study in 2023 for Ramsey County. We would love to join the state in that effort, but unfortunately they were unable to get that authority last session and waiting for them to do that um, feels like a long wait when this is such critical work to our strategic priorities and building wealth in our community. We are gonna be asking our peer jurisdictions if they'd like to join us and go out to RFP with us. And so um, I think this is a great move forward that ties not only foundational excellence, but what you're gonna see at the end with procurement modernization together as well. With that, for that section, let's stand for questions. So any questions on the foundational excellence piece or comments? Yeah, Commissioner Reinhardt. I just wanted to comment on, I mean, all of this makes uh, perfect sense to me in, in trying to move forward on these things, but I especially appreciate the comments on the disparity study um, because there were reasons, I remember back in 2017 when we decided we weren't going to do this um, in conjunction with the state, but um, the, it, there's so much has changed <laughs> just since 2017. Um, and so I think the time is right, and I fully support moving forward with this. Um, and hopefully we can uh, get some of our peers or the state of Minnesota to move forward with it. Uh, we will see, but I think it's really going to help us. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner mm -hmm. Reinhardt. Uh, County Manager O'Connor. Thanks, Madam Chair. Just to emphasize a couple of points um, at a broader policy level, uh, I appreciate the walkthrough at a more granular level today. I think the community auditors are one of the most important parts of truly getting looks into like residents for service delivery at point of service, at point of phone call, et cetera, across our organization. It's just, I feel like that's gonna be a really important knowledge tool for us as we move forward in understanding um, much of what we sometimes get or you all get right now anecdotally, but in a way that allows us to create a formal feedback mechanism back to the organization. And so that's, that is a priority for sure for next year. Um, more broadly, one of the things we have learned as we move toward a service team and more um, aligned structure across the organization is you can better see areas of gap that exist in one pocket or across the org. And a lot of this work is a manifestation of that. Um, and I'll end on an example that comes from, uh, Deanna, some of what you spoke to. As we've built up our work in the compliance and ethics office, around audit and other pieces, one of the biggest things we find, and we've heard this from the board before, but how do you learn from, so you have something happen, right? Maybe you even have a closed session on it, and then you get to follow up steps and remediation. Who, who and where ensures that occurs? And I'll tell you, over the last five years, we've tried a lot of different ways on that, but in a department by department structure, it is very difficult to have a holder of the insurance of compliance. And these investments allow us to answer that question in a way that I think is important. And I, I want to call that out because it's been a question that bothered me and I know many of you along the way. Mm -hmm. And this is a spot where I finally feel like we have an approach here that will address that head on and say, here is the holder of it. Here is the documentation and the logs of what got done. And it's more consistent than right now where sometimes that happens better than other times. Thank yeah. you. Commissioner Carter. Thank you. I. Um, Again, this is an opportunity to say thank you for making certain that the investment this board has been willing to make is described and implemented and operated in such a way as to align with our goals for our community. Uh, it's very clear the manner in which you have built this work is intentionally to ensure that we're able to deliver on the work that we promised to our community. I certainly admire also that you've taken the care to create that community audit function, not knowing exactly what that's going to look like, but how important it is that it link back to those that are impacted and those who care about that impact <coughs> together with us. So, and the, the last thing I will say is that I very much appreciate your willingness to lead in a space where the difference it can make for us, given our demographics and the conditions of our community, will make that incredible difference for us. 
based on your willingness to lead, even in a space where the state has not declared, um, is having difficulty, you know, finding the support, and where no one else has. For us, the difference it will make to help us map back to the areas of need where we have not had a recent disparity study. That is the important, important piece that you're putting in front of us. And I, we, want to say thank you so much for identifying that and for placing that information in the hands of this policy group that can now act on your recommendation. <laughs> so again, thank you so very much and for the leadership. Hopefully others will join us. If not, you know, thanks for stepping out on the faith that this must be done. Thank you, Commissioner Carter. Commissioner Pretham. Yeah, I'm just wondering if you could speak to, uh, so for this investigation teams, is that all internal, like workplace complaints, HR related, or would this also be investigations into, you know, appropriate use of funds uh, with contractors or vendors or with our programs, or how, what is that team? So our team is our, our workplace investigators, and we have recently, started the work to formalize, you know, their focus, their structure, and, and their remit. Um, but when it, so they would also, that would also include fraud, but we are hoping to, you know, working toward, not hoping, working to build the audit function as well to look into um, some of the things involving contracting, things like that. That's, that's better placed in an audit function. And even if we call, for instance, even if we look to um, leverage outside audit, we would also have our internal audit to support and be our conduit to that um, service as well. Does that make sense? Okay. I think so, yes. Okay. Thank you, I don't see any other hands. I have a question actually to that point. Nicole, you must have been thinking like I was. I was um, and mostly because, Deanna, first I want to say, good job at building this out. You know, we hired you, I think, just as we had a pandemic hit. You didn't know anyone. You didn't know anyone <laughs> in the county. We're like, hey, come over and become our first compliance and ethics officer. And oh, by the way, we're going to get millions of dollars we didn't expect. So good job at building out your team in a perfect storm. Uh, and I'm glad you and Alex have, have uh, bonded over this really important work at the same time. And as I'm looking at this, this chart, it really is impressive and how long this hat takes and how much work I know went into it. So I just wanted to lift that up for a moment. And as we're talking about investigations, so I think all of us as commissioners occasionally get emails from either employees or community members who have a, a grievance against maybe another employee or situation. Is that the kind of thing that your team would be investigating and, and what would that process be when we receive those complaints? Do we just send them to you? Do we send them to our offices? I think that's important for us to understand process. Yes, thank you, um, Madam Chair. I, I think, um, so we do have a process for reporting internal uh, complaints and issues, and also if you receive anything from external um, uh, the community, that yes, you would send it over to um, the investigations unit, and right now there's a portal that I could not tell you off the top of my okay. head, um, but it's, it's on uh, RamseyNet internally. Um, we are in the beta stage of, of our case management tool, and we're working on having links externally and internally. And unfortunately, Christine Weber, who um, really worked very diligently to, to implement the tool, could tell you all about it. Um, but it won't change very much. It won't change the external look so much as to what people see and how they, they but it will, it, will, um, it will modernize sort of the way that the information is pulled in okay. and also some of the questions and so on and the, the guided um, input that people put into the system. <coughs> um, and also, the, but the out external look of course will lean heavily on communications to help um, structure that piece. Great, thank you. Uh, I imagine O'Connor and then. Madam Chair, um, Commissioners, I would just say too, if you get an a complaint from anyone from the public or an employee, uh, I can be your one door and I'll make okay. sure that it goes to the correct spot. That's a uh, part of my work with Deanna and, and others as well. I did just share with the county board the link to the employee uh, workplace investigation or report, filing a report area of our website so you can see that as well. And then 
to the earlier question of Commissioner Fredlin that kind of ties here, based on the nature of any given complaint that comes in, then we do an evaluation of what is the right, first of all, is, does this rise to the level of an investigation and then internal or externally investigated is a question that we work through and we'll continue to do that even as we build supports. Yes, and, and I guess I could have said, you can send them to me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate that. We want to do it the right way too, so yes. this is helpful. Uh, Commissioner McGuire. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just spread up a, a, a question on another area, um, on the building and internal audit office. And so um, we have external audits done of our, of our county, our budgeting system and everything, and I know. Um, so this would be the internal. Could you just describe a little bit more what this office will do? This is because um, we've 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 been we've done audits before. I mean, our county is a part of a lot of audits because we have to be, and uh, for our finances and everything. So could you, yeah, just explain a little more what this is, and then community auditors, just what what that role is again. I know yeah. you mentioned it briefly. I'm just if you could <laughs> talk a little bit more about it. Thank you, Commissioner, Madam Chair. Um, yes, so the audit function, it would be, you know, structured very, very um, aligned, it, very much in alignment with the traditional internal audit function. We've looked at um, Hennepin County, um, City of Minneapolis, a couple of other counties um, have close contact with their auditors, um, and we're, we're moving to align ourselves very closely to how some of those other municipalities are structured. So it would be a unit internally um, led by um, a function that would work with the county, work with Jenny, um, our risk manager, to look at our, our risk assessment um, to determine how, where our risk lie, some of our highest risks, some of the mo more urgent ones, to focus on where we need to look first and put in, putting together hopefully an annual work plan, maybe even a five-year plan that's flexible, of course, and then going out and um, conducting audits throughout the county, and then reporting back to the audit committee, um, the audit committee reporting back to the larger um, board, and then um, just going about make, ensuring that the work is completed, that's, that's identified in the audits. Um, they would also oversee um, the audits that we are required to conduct internally, um, and the audits that we're required to submit to um, by external agencies and ensuring that we have a view and that your, that your body has a view of all of those audits because right now, to my knowledge, there is no one sort of single source of truth as to where um, those audits are conducted, when they're conducted, and what's entailed unless, they, unless there's an issue that gets escalated. And even in that case, uh, you know, we might not have a consistent approach as to how it gets escalated um, up to the county manager's office and even to you. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, no, that's helpful. Okay. Just a little bit more on the community auditors. So are we bringing in people, uh, uh, these are auditors from the community coming in or just talk a little bit about what that concept. Yeah, and I think that I, intentionally, I was um, very high level there yeah. because there's still some work to be done in discussions um, but I think, um, oh, sorry, I think Ryan wants to oh, step okay. in here. I didn't mean to cut you off, Tina, okay. but M Madam Chair Commissioner, I'd just say it this way. There's financial audits that get done through processes that already exist. There's program audits, which you're hearing about here and we're building out where we have had no internal capacity in the past really to do that. And the audit committee will play a big role in helping to guide that. But then there's also service delivery level audits, which is what we're looking at here with these community auditors, which is, okay, we say we wanna do things a certain way, how consistent are we, is it happening that way, what are we being told, what is that telling us about our system and our service delivery? So we'll hire people from the community to help us with that assessment. Thank you. Yes. Thank yeah. you. Excellent. All right, I think, thank you, Deanna. Uh, we're gonna move on now to um, enterprise risk management. Um, and. I think we're starting with Jenny, who is probably the most um, energetic enterprise risk manager in the business, <laughs> from my experience. That is very true. Wow, that's quite a quite an introduction. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, I'm Jenny Grosskopf. I'm the enterprise risk manager for Ramsey County, and um, thrilled to be here this morning to talk to you a little bit about some of the progress that we've been making with our program over the last year. And um, 
I feel like I start it from a place of it being an extension of our foundation of excellence, right? It wasn't one of the areas that we maybe spent money or dedicated money to in the last year, but for sure it's an extension. And I think a, a big part of our approach over the last year has been this underlying theme of partnership between risk management, compliance, finance, HR, the attorney's office, uh, because it can't exist on an island. It needs to be um, groomed and partnered, and we need to develop this culture of risk management. And that's really kind of been my foundation that I'm trying to build this program on, because I think it speaks volumes that uh, my position didn't exist before 2017, 2018 um, here at Ramsey County. So we're uh, um, forging a path and building a culture and program that's gonna support uh, the needs we have with respect to risk management. So um, just wanted to start from a place of um, talking about the difference between a traditional risk management approach versus the enterprise risk management approach, and it really uh, lies on this foundation of traditional risk management was all about risk transfer, risk avoidance, right? We manage our insurance policies. We try to transfer risk with our contracting. Um, we're still doing those things. I'm still managing our insurance portfolio through a combination of self-insured and insured avenues. But in addition to that, we're looking more strategically at the top rated risks that are forced, that are facing our organization. And we're looking at them as an organization as a whole versus this siloed approach to addressing things from a department or a service team approach alone. Um, refer back to my notes. That's what happens when you start going off script, right? Um, I think it's important to point out too that it's significant in the support of taking risks Instead of just risk avoidance, we want to make sure that when it's appropriate and when it's supporting our goals, we're taking those risks. Um, I would offer that the work we did with the procurement modernization project and um, reducing some of our insurance requirements in an effort to work with our vendors and community is an example of where it was appropriate for us to take that risk. Um, next slide is just a further extension of this idea of enterprise risk management um, being more about moving from a transactional approach to a more strategic approach where we're working to create that um, risk management culture and evolve to a strategic look at all of our risks. When I spoke to the audit committee, um, I spoke about the fact that the response of this organization to COVID is really enterprise risk management in action. And I think it speaks volumes that as an organization, you were able to respond in the ways that you did to the numerous risks and challenges that came in responding to the pandemic. Um, we maybe weren't using the same language of enterprise risk management, but you were doing the work, right? We, we engaged a broad audience to make sure you've got the subject matter experts all at the table and we're approaching this as a team. We're looking at it with an enterprise-wide lens and we're focusing on the right stuff. We're making sure we've got limited resources. We know that. We want to make sure we're getting the most impact for our buck and, and spending our time and resources on those top-rated things. Um, and then, again, understanding that risk um, represents both potential outcomes of positives and negatives. The work that was done during the pandemic um, just provides evidence that Ramsey County is, is prepared and able to move forward in advancing this enterprise risk management approach. Um, and one more slide that just articulates this idea of we don't want to miss opportunities because we're focusing on risk avoidance. We want to use the enterprise risk management <coughs> process to assess decision making and risks so that when it's appropriate, we're making the most of opportunities. That might mean a little bit of risk as an organization, but um, the gains that we'll make on our other goals make it worth taking. The way that we started uh, this year, next, sorry, Alex, you're doing a good job advancing the slides without me reminding you. Um, it's just another example of the telepathy, the partnership we've got going. Uh, so the first thing that we did was took a look at the structure of the enterprise risk management program that existed prior to my tenure at Ramsey County. And prior to my coming on board, um, our deputy county managers um, and a couple others were essentially forming that team. 
uh, and we felt like it was maybe a little bit too top heavy. And so I worked with the deputy county managers and we realigned a team that um, represented the critical functions across all of our service teams. Um, and we brought that team of new individuals together, uh, Alex Cutsey and um, our compliance manager, manager Deanna, director, excuse Chief. me, Chief, direct, <laughs> Chief Compliance Manager, thank you, Deanna, um, serve as our executive sponsors for the program, and so I'm working closely with them as we move it forward, um, and I've been meeting with that advisory committee over the last year. Much of our focus uh, was spent on refining um, many risk registers that existed. Um, the risk registers were defined by service teams in some areas by departments, uh, and we had a list of roughly 138 risks. There was a lot of duplication amongst risks defined a little bit differently. Um, the risk registers were, were just a little bit uh, jumbled in the way that um, they were together. A lot of really hard good work that was done, but didn't give us an actionable list that we could move forward with. And so uh, with the advisory, the advisory committee, as well as a consultant that we've been working with, that's an expert in enterprise risk management from Gallagher, um, we worked to really refine those risk registers. I thought it was important for us to have an organization wide risk register. Uh, Deanna and I talked a lot about that. And we were able to um, work with our consultant, again, work with the advisory committee, and whittle that list down to a meaningful list of 25 risks that represent the key areas of risks for our organization. Um, about the same time that we got to that point and we were ready to move forward into things like scoring those risks and deciding who would be the risk owner and how we start moving forward in treatments for those risks, um, I recognized that the organization was, was experiencing a lot of initiatives all at once and being mindful of the fact that everyone has a lot going. Um, I didn't want the Enterprise Risk Management Program to be one more thing that people felt was you know, just another um, uh, program coming that they didn't have capacity for. And I thought instead, given the maturity of our organization with respect to risk management, it would perhaps be a better approach for us to pivot to a workshop format where we use some workshops with subject matter experts across our organization on some of these key areas that represent the 25 risks. Um, these areas are things like employee safety, employee field safety, um, law enforcement liability, just some of the areas that we saw, we saw standing out. Um, and so we are, are in the process of doing that. I had a meeting earlier this week um, with um, Deputy County Manager uh, Scott William and several others talking about this idea of employee safety and how we move forward in perhaps creating some more capacity um, to support the efforts of enterprise risk management and organization-wide employee safety, um, and we're gonna have some more conversations about that and look, look to hear more from us in the coming year um, around workshops where we'll dive into the idea of those risks and formally identifying solutions and treatments that we can apply to that. Okay. All right, and lastly, um, just wanted to remind you again that we are focused on having those top rated risks um, align with our strategic goals. Um, I think risk management along with all of the other areas of um, strategic excellence that you've heard about, it's this idea of the efficient, effective operations to support our goals that you talked about in your meeting this morning. Um, we're not always the flashiest uh, departments in the room, um, but we really are providing that strong foundation that, you know, if we're doing things right and we're saving costs in terms of liability for the county and claims with our vehicles or injuries to our employees, if we're doing all of those things right and minimizing the risks that our service teams are encountering in the important work they do, it leaves more money for us to partner with community and provide the services that are so meaningful to the work and the difference we wanna be making in terms of um, building that wealth in our community. So uh, with that, I would stand for any questions.
Yeah, thank you. I, I just want to say you might not be the flashiest, but it is a department that will make or break an organization, and so it's really critical infrastructure. So thank you for your work. Commissioner thank McDonough. You, Chair. Oh, thanks, Madam Chair. If we could go back to slide 16 briefly. And I think, you know, you've talked about it, you know, maybe, um, I guess I want to call it out in a way much more deliberate here. Because I, this is key, you, you, you had the little kind of the, the roadmap of moving from, you know, transactional risk management to strategic. And it doesn't get talked about a lot here, but there's always, always this risk when you allow that transactional risk management to dictate how you move forward. And that risk is you don't achieve the organizational goals. And in the end, that means you become less of a mission-driven organization because you can never get to a mission-driven organization unless you're actually achieving those organizational goals. And the, the, the biggest risk is you lose trust in the community because as a governing board, we lay out the mission and we lay out um, working with the county manager and the leadership, the goals and the strategies to move forward. But under that transactional risk management, usually becomes the barrier to us achieving those. They either take it sideways, they water it down um, because of that transactional approach and having that strategic approach where you actually identify, manage, and account for those risks to allow you to be able to move forward to achieving these goals and that mission is critical. And I think this is so important for the work that we've been doing um, to really, you know, I, I talk to new employees, I'm out in the community all the time, but the one thing that's always been difficult is how do we deliver? We have to do more than just be words, right? We actually have to have this transformation, transformative change in our community. And to be able to do that is, is, as the chair just pointed out, the foundation is being able to recognize the risks, mm -hmm. account for the risks, but don't let the risk stop us from being able to move forward. So I appreciate the work that you're doing on this. Thank you, Thank you Commissioner, Madam Chair. It, it really is this idea of moving from risk management being sometimes what had a reputation as the office of no to um, you know moving beyond one risk manager and building risk managers across the organization so we can share that language and speak and assessment process. You can just rebrand to the office of what would it take to get to yes. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Excellent. I don't see any other questions. Thank you, Jenny. We'll be moving on to the long-awaited procurement modernization. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, so I wanted to go back. This is actually a slide that I presented here in March of 2022. It looked a little different because my colleague over here, um, the chief compliance and ethics officer, also is very good at PowerPoint. And if you need some help with slides that don't just have words on them, she's your person. Um, but back in March, if you remember, I was, you know, we were here for an entire day and we talked all about where we were trying to go. And I just want to remind us what we're trying to do. We're trying to review the procurement process from start to finish. Everything from when I say I need to buy, whatever that is all the way to like how do you how do you do that what are the steps to get there um, how do we follow up with contract administration who is involved transparency throughout the process efficiency throughout the process what tools we need to support that process and it should be simple and flexible to get the collaborative in, like the end, as Tara mentioned earlier, this is a collaboration. We work with the county attorney's office and finance and many others. Every, almost everyone in this county touches contracting. And so I just want to remind everybody of where we started. Um, and then we have our, our program structure. So I am the sponsor and then we have the executive steering team with a number of my colleagues um, from the uh, executive team, but also from senior management team. And we have an advisory team which is half made up of community members who have experience with our, with our contracting process and then some leaders within the county. We have the core team, and I'm gonna talk more about the work they're doing, but they are really the experts and who interacts, does a lot of work in procurement throughout the county and kind of doing our future state visioning. And we have four sub teams that we're gonna give you an update on that you've heard some of these. The fourth one is a new one. 
which I'm gonna talk about next. This kind of ties into the disparity study and thinking about um, how we're, we're trying to maximize our use of, of um, different vendors and not just the CERT program, but other vendors that are disadvantaged businesses. Um, to, there's, there are opportunities to do that without a disparity study, and I don't want you to think even though we're pursuing that option that we're not pursuing all of the options in front of us. So this is one area that I wanted to highlight. It's called Promoting Inclusion and Equity Subteam, or PI, because everybody likes PI. <laughs> um, and it's really threefold. I did not think of that, by the way. I wish I had, but uh, I think the person who thought of it's in the room back there. But um, so, you know, we have, there are state programs and other programs that, that are part of organizations with disparity studies that highlight um, businesses that are minority, female, veteran, disability owned businesses. And how do we do business with them as a county? We can do business with all sorts of organizations. We're not prevented from doing that. We're prevented from having a race and gender based program that awards points based on that. So we're looking at ways to increase our spending with these particular vendors. And this group is tasked with exploring these three items. The first is really looking at how do we make sure that our solicitations get to those state and federal programs we have highlighted here, the Minnesota Unified Certification Program and the TGEDVO, because the state has to have lots of initials, um, which is Small Businesses Targeted Group Economically Disadvantaged and Veteran-Owned Programs. How do we make sure when we issue a solicitation that it gets to those vendors and we welcome their applications for these? The second is I would love to get to an auto membership in the CERT program. Say, if you were in MNUCP, if you're in the TG, um, EDVO, the small business state programs, you're automatically in CERT. We've been starting to talk about that with our CERT um, partners, and that would be a great win for not only us, but the other CERT mm -hmm. organizations. And then third is, we already contract with some of these businesses, and how do we highlight that spend? When we come before you, I know, during our performance measures presentation during the budget, um, you know, Commissioner Ortega was right to point out that we are not meeting our goals in this area. So how do we look at that and do better, but also look at where are we actually spending money with these vendors, but not capturing that, and how do we account for that as well? Um, this work is gonna be, oh, sorry. Finish the slide, I was, before you move to the next This slide. work is gonna be done in collaboration with our purchasing and contracting action teams. This is overlap, I think of it as a Venn diagram, right? They do some work, we do some work, and it overlaps, and we have a lot of momentum in this area that I wanna use to carry us forward with this work. Awesome, County Manager Connor wants to add it. Thanks, Madam Chair. I just wanna, because it's confusing, the disparity study piece is confusing, and you've all gotten to spend time with it, but for others, so, um, the study highlights where disparities are seen in terms of where our spend is currently going in terms of race and gender um, across the variety of categories and then unlocks tools that allow you to target race and gender based on what the study shows you. So just to be clear, it's not as though you just can do it. That's why you can't do it otherwise and you don't just do it until you have the data, but the data unlocks the tools that allow you to say we have an issue in X area and we now can apply a tool directly into X area to address the issue. Whereas right now what we've been doing is we're around the margins a little too much and that's we're struggling to be as incisive as we want to be. And I just want to really double down on that point of the importance of why we see that study being a big step moving forward. Great. So that's the new sub team. I'm going to turn it over to um, Tara Bach to talk about the updates from the other existing uh, groups. Thank you. So she talked a little bit about, Alex talked a little bit about the structure for the program, the, modern, the procurement modernization program. And so I just wanna highlight some of the great work that's being done by the various teams associated with, uh, with the program uh, because their work is very critical to the overall success of procurement modernization. So um, just, I'm um, going to touch on a couple things for each team. So the advisory team, which includes community members, they we have been meeting on a monthly basis since July, and they we bring things forward to them and ask them to really challenge us. Like, are we are we going far enough? Are we doing the right things? So 
so far we've, they have provided some feedback on how we evaluate proposals and, and award contracts to vendors and they've been providing some great input. Um, they've also been helping us to figure out how to better communicate um, solicitation opportunities in our community and so we're working to implement some of those changes. Uh, the core team, um, which I know Alex will talk a little bit more about, but that is the group that is really focused on what does the future state of procurement look like? What does our organizational structure need to be to support those new processes? What policies need to be changed? All of those types of things. Then we have the evaluation and award sub team, and that group um, has already done a lot of great work developing new standards and processes um, in how we evaluate proposals and, and creating guidelines. So across the county, we're doing it consistently. They will be tasked in the future, coming up soon, will be figuring out a tool in how, where do we post all of our solicitation opportunities, uh, keeping our community partners in mind as we do that. Then we've got the um, IT purchasing and contracting sub team, um, which is in partnership with our information services department. So just to highlight one change that they made is we had a security questionnaire that goes out to any vendors that um, are contracted for any IT related work. That questionnaire used to be 196 questions and that has now been reduced to 21. Um, we think potentially it kept vendors from responding when you look at this form and how complicated it is. So, so, but that's just the beginning and they've identified many opportunities for improvement around that area. And then, um, as mentioned, the PI is a new group and we're just in the stages of recruiting members and really defining the work of that team. Great, thank you. So as part of that, we have done, I won't, all of you know there have been some quick hits that have happened along the way to not only build momentum, but to make the changes we can make immediately to resolve some of the issues in our process. So you all know we changed thanks to um, you know, our enterprise risk manager, Jenny. She helped us change some of our insurance requirements, which was a huge win for all of us, not only with our vendors, but also internally. Um, I think Tara mentioned the advisory team. I think this came from them and other community members have reached out that they need a sample invoice. So now we have a sample invoice on our website. An easy, quick fix to say, hey, if you want to invoice the county, here's what you need to have on there and here's how to do it. Right? We have the, our, the request for proposals that are no longer needing to come back to county board approval and that was just implemented. That's our most recent one and we'll be providing you with a robust reporting on that. And we eliminated the need to post solicitations in the local newspaper and the sealed bids, which cut out weeks from the process, which has been really great. Um, I wanted to highlight that we have a few more quick hits we're, we're looking at. Um, it, things related to expired contracts, multiple payments on a single PO, and amendments to contracts. These don't sound as flashy maybe in the moment, but they're big deals for a lot of people and a lot of things we hear about both internally from our own staff and from our community partners. We're doing a little back and forth here. I'm yes. going to hand it back to Tara. So I'm going to talk just briefly about our proof of concept initiatives. You may recall that um, three of these have come forward to you um, for approval, and it's a different way of soliciting, um, doing solicitations. So um, I just want to just real quickly touch on what are some of the differences between kind of our current process of, of doing solicitations and this new proof of concept. So um, for one, it's more collaborative, relationship-based process between the program leads, finance, and county attorney's office, as well as community partners. Um, we're putting applications on the county's website instead of having to go through DemandStar and looking at the lengthy RFP document, we're just putting the request out on the, on the county website. Here are the services we're looking for. Here's an application you can fill out and submit to the county. Um, we've been holding information sessions with vendors to explain, here's the services we're looking for. Here's how you apply for this. Um, with acknowledging you have to be very careful about, you can't help them design their program, but, um, but just trying to give them as much information up front before they actually apply. 
um, we're utilizing the new streamlined evaluation process that the sub team uh, put together in how we evaluate these applications that are being submitted. Uh, we're using shorter, more concise agreement templates. Um, so the, the final contracts are, are just more simpler to read, um, among many others. But I just wanted to highlight, to give you a kind of a, an idea about the difference in this process. Um, the proof of concept initiatives is really utilizing some processes that were done back in 2019 and 2020, where there were a couple pilots done um, around uh, wraparound, immigration wraparound services and the census outreach grants, as well as the 2020 um, emergency purchase process that was used. So we're kind of taking some of the learnings from those things and we've created this proof of concept initiative that continues to evolve. And the work um, with these proof of concept will provide insight um, and inform what our future state of procurement looks like. Um, and we're currently focused specifically on professional services agreements and grant expenditure agreements. So um, just to highlight three of the proofs of concepts that we've done so far, we've done one in workforce and inclusive employer grant, and that one was completed over the summer. We did um, an evaluation with everyone involved and took the learnings from that to continue to improve the process. Um, we're still working with transforming systems together on the child protection foster care grants, um, and they're at the process where they're going to be um, executing some grant agreements here over the next several weeks. And then the third one, which we're in earlier stages, is the public health um, community innovation for <coughs> racial and health equity. And the goal is to have that opportunity on the county's website on December 14th. Again, this has been a partnership among the programs, finance, county attorney's office, um, and it, so far, so good. Excellent. Commissioner Carter. This is um, <clears throat> overwhelming success, I think, in terms of the direction that you've identified we're moving in. I'd just like to ask a, fundam a fundamental question, <clears throat> and that is, you know, sometimes when you're doing things, you continue to do them because you've always done them that way. And I'm not saying that that's why we've continued to operate as we have, but what you're discovering in terms of the changes that we can make that do not take us outside of statute, because I know you never do anything, that would create the kind of risk that um, would mean that we're, we're doing anything that it has already been stated we cannot do. Can you very simply <laughs> share with me all of us, you know, how you're threading that um, needle, you know, between what we cannot do, what we've always done, and what we perceived we need to do and so are changing too. Can you just give me, I know you've, you've got committees and the whole bit, but what's the simple line, although I know the operations of it is not simple, that we are going through in order to get to where we want to be? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question, Commissioner. I think the difference is, um, is in the county's current policies uh, dictate how we, not dictate, but guide how we do procurement. The, the notion that these came to you as, um, as a county board to get approval to try these other processes sort of takes out that okay, we're gonna try this new process knowing we may not be following county policy. It is still within any state or federal guidelines um, as far as the process, and we envision this changing our county policies moving forward so that we can do these things differently. Thank um, you for the proof of concept exploration. Yeah. I think that really, really helps me because of course we built these policies yeah. to protect our community, and as we look to serve our community, we must also then assess those policies. Thank right. you. Yep. And, um, yeah. Madam Chair, I, I just add one other piece to it on the legacy side. I mean, we're still 
relatively for an organization of our size and age new in this space in that it was, I'm forgetting what year, 2015 or 14 when we began to move into having our own procurement office away from St. Paul. And so there's a part of that transition where you maybe start with the template that had existed. And I think what you're seeing is as we've worked with the board and continue to hear feedback here and bring that back into our work, we say, what do we want out of this system, not a port from what it used to potentially be going forward? Right. Okay, um, to wrap up this section, I think uh, to, your, to your question, Commissioner Perry kind of helped me wrap this whole thing up. What's, what's next? I mean, we have some very skilled subject matter experts. Dana Nofke, our procurement manager, and her staff are excellent at procurement, and we'll make sure that we align with federal and state law. But outside of that, I have constantly said everything is on the table. So let's really think about it. We've involved community, so they push us and they ask us questions. Into the core team, we've brought some other people um, from within the county, but who also really are invested in making sure we do this differently. Jenny's been involved in like, okay, where can we take some risks? She talked about that earlier. Where is there room for us to take risks? And I also have to remind myself, I mean, I have worked in government for a very long time, and once so I have to step back and say, okay, like, am I reacting to this because I've always done it this way? Or like, how can I rethink how we do procurement? And we can talk to our neighboring jurisdictions who do things a little different than us. We've had presentations from Hennepin County. We've ta I've talked to the city of St. Paul and Minneapolis and trying to think outside the box, but within the legal parameters. And luckily we have a great team that's at the table trying to do that. And so turning to what's next in 2023, um, cause I know you'll be inviting me back uh, to <laughs> present more on procurement modernization, but really we're shifting to the future state, the core team, um, is meeting in January for an entire week in, per in person to lay out where are we going and then how do we get there in 2023. We've got some big things going, as Tara mentioned, in the IT world and how we do that questionnaire, which goes alongside of this. Um, but I really see 2023 as, okay, we've done the quick hits, we have the right team, we're really close on a future structure, now we need to put it all together and get to the future state in 2023. Um, so I think you're gonna see big changes. There's gonna be a Ramsey News article. Everybody who's watching pay attention next week. That's gonna be all focused on the IS work that's being done. Um, and, and we'll continue to move along the path of those sub teams. But I really think what we're gonna be seeing is what is the future state of Ramsey County procurement and how did we learn from all of the things we have done, including COVID and many of these other um, kind of pilots to get to where we are. And we won't necessarily get it perfect the first time, but we'll continue to improve upon that and, and hear the feedback and do much better. I'm excited for what's to come in 2023. Uh, are there questions? I just have one question and I don't know where this plugs in, if it's in the procurement process or if it's in our RFP process, but you know, in the past we've talked about, especially when we're procuring from like a big source, maybe not a local vendor, but buying product or that we're making sure that um, we're using partners that meet all of our values. And so on that lens, how are we also including our environmental sustainability and thinking consciously about what it is we're purchasing, how we're purchasing, what's the source um, of those purchases? Is that part of this or is that something that we should, you know, kind of add to that criteria? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Commissioners, that's an excellent question and one that I think we probably haven't explicitly contemplated, although I know there are plenty of um, RFPs and solicitations that go out, especially in the property management and the public works areas that are extremely mindful of climate impacts and how we do business from an environmental standpoint. Um, I'd probably have to go back to my team to know how we think about that in terms of how we do solicitations. So I'll note that down and follow up with you for sure. Great, thanks. Since you said everything should be on the table, I just add that. Yeah, to the, no, absolutely. To the list is one of our strategic priorities in the way that we're doing our sustainability and resilience work. 
I don't see any other questions. Thank you all very much. Thanks for your work, and especially doing a workshop right after we passed a budget. So thank you to <laughs> your team uh, and being aware of how hard you've worked this year and a great way to close out our year with you all. And, Madam um, Chair, if you don't mind, can I just thank my strategic yeah. team colleagues, Dr. Mm -hmm. Forbenian is yes. here, and then Elizabeth Tolzman, the Director of Policy and Planning. This is our committee of the whole, and you got to see some great representation of our team here presenting, but they're also supporting us and making sure we get all these things done and helping get to the table, even on budget day. Yes. <laughs> Thank you all. Thanks very much. With that, we are adjourned, and we'll see you back here at 1.30. Thank you. about carbon monoxide and carbon monoxide alarms.